Hey everyone, Freak here. Welcome to my patch 8.5 rundown for League of Legends. 8.5 is one of the smaller patches, and yeah, it's not huge, so let's talk about what's going on into it. Um, I do think most changes are pretty good. Um, not sure all of them are, but I think pretty much everything's going in the right direction. I think there's a decent mix of buffs and nerfs, so let's get into it. Uh, first of all, Kais is coming out. If you haven't watched the spotlight, please do so. I voiced it, so... That's cool. There's fun jokes and stuff in there as well as the champion's super cool. I'm very excited for Kaisa. I think she's going to be really, really, really fun. Um, whether she's viable in pro or not is entirely a coin flip because I don't really believe outside of specific, specific cases that like types of kits can't be viable in pro. Even Darius got played in Worlds um, and truly wasn't that strong when it happened. So, I don't know. We'll see what happens. Either way, she's a cool bro. Great. Let's move on. Uh, oh, one other thing I want to talk about with 8.5 is, <clears throat> uh, for those who are watching in real time, this video is coming out on uh, Tuesday, the 6th of March. Uh, Korea just got onto 8.4 basically last night, which means in two weeks, LCK will be on the patch. Uh, NA and EU LCS will be on the patch. Uh, 8.5 um, <clears throat> for week 9, which also means that that'll be the patch for playoffs because there is not a break between week 9 and the start of quarterfinals, and patches don't change during playoffs. So this is the NA and EU LCS playoff patch, and assuming I understand the LCK schedule appropriately, which I'm pretty sure I do, it is also going to be the LCK LPL LMS patch, pretty sure. Um, there's a chance it goes plus or minus one, but that's basically what we're looking at here. This is the patch for whether or not TSM makes their 17,000th consecutive NALCS final. This is the one. This is the one. Let's get into it. Azir nerfs, uh, and mostly at his early game, Q is the ability he maxes first. Flat damage down 10 to 30. Of course, the AP ratio is still there, so late game eventually will still happen. And it's continuing, continuing, continuing the trend, and at least is consistent, of nerfing Azir's early game and his early mid game uh, so that he can remain the late game scaling champion that he is, and there's more play against him early game. From what I've heard talking with pros in the NALCS, uh, the early game is actually more abusable, that the cooldown nerf that happened in 8.3 actually meant something. He's only like the number two or three mid lane pick based on which patch you're looking at. To be fair, in 8.3 Zoe was above him and in 8.4 Rise is above him. Both those champions obviously were pretty busted in pro. At least people thought Zoe was busted in pro. I'm not confident that she really was that strong, but whatever, uh, too late now. Um, and so this basically meant that Azir was going to be cream of the crop since Ryze is getting nerfed in 8-4 as well. And I think it's reasonable that he was getting nerfed. Um, <clears throat> makes sense for pro. I think he is slightly weak for solo queue, but mostly because his mastery curve is so damn tall. So uh, it's understandable. I think this is reasonable to nerf Azir a little bit more. And again, early game being more and more of a weakness seems reasonable, and I'm glad about that. All right, next up. Oh, and here's the math real quick. There's Azir's damage output. Um, here, I'll scroll slightly if you can see the title. Uh, yep, it's a you know 14 to 18 percent cut in the damage output, and of course he has to persist throughout the game. But again, AP ratio is a thing, and he's going to auto attack after every Q no matter what anyway. So uh, some of that's not completely fair on the damage side. Next up is of course Galio. Q cost and cooldown changes. I do want to point out that Galio is going for a catalyst literally every game ever. In pro, it's sometimes Roa, sometimes Abyssal Mask, and in solo queue, it's basically only Roa. I'm of the opinion that AP Galio is the correct build for Galio, by the way. I think his ratios are so good that if you start with Abyssal Mask, I think your damage is too low and you don't get to do good things. Um, that said, you really need other frontliners to engage with if you're going to play AP Galio, which increase, you know, which which puts some level of tax on the champion. Either way, mana cost got worse and cooldown got worse even at max rank, uh, so you can never really recover from that. Um, Right, early Galio, literally unaffected levels 1 through 3, but a pretty substantial buff to the mana cost, or I should say hike to the mana cost, 44% more. Cooldown meaningfully up as well, uh, which is, you know, unfortunate for him. But that said, he is reasonably strong in solo queue, it feels like, and he's the number 2 or 3 mid laner in pro, just like Azir was uh, as of 8.3 and 8.4. So I think, yeah. Uh, one thing I do want to point out is because a lot of Galio's strength is ability to wave clear and then roam off the ultimate, if he somehow does actually oom and is unable to use his Q anymore, um, and then roam, it could sledgehammer the champion. Now, I don't think it's going to happen. I really don't at all. I think that's basically never going to be the case. As we saw with Talia, for example, when her mana cost got hiked, they had to go back to Lost Chapter first item, and she kept being a viable mid laner. So, uh, I don't think this knocks Galio out of pro. I think that is 
incredibly short-sighted by pros if it does. This shouldn't be a big enough nerf to knock him out of pro. Um, but yeah, a meaningful hit to his wave clear, which is weird for a melee champion who can be harassed, but we're spending a lot of time on something that's a very, very minor change, uh, all things considered. All right, next up, buffs to Jin, and first of all, XD. The passive scales from 4 to 44% instead of 2 to 40. This is not an accident. They're trying really hard to keep making the joke happen. Uh, otherwise, Dancing Grenade's AD ratio goes up, and Deadly Flourish now roots off of any damage dealt by Jin, which includes his R, his Q, and things like Static Shiv. Um, red buff would probably renew the duration as well, etc. So all of these are meaningful changes. So first up, uh, the actual AD... Um, gained. Uh, now, want to point out this column on the right, though it says oh, you have 2 to 3% more total damage. This does not count the fact that he has an additional attack speed and or critical strike chance percent AD ratio thing going on here. So uh, in real terms, he's not actually having 3% more attack damage in the late game, um, but that's okay. Either way, uh, it is still a buff to the amount of damage he gained. What I actually should have done is just simply shown, nah, it's fine. We're good here. Uh, the math would have been really wonky for anything more complex than this this is still reasonable as far as the q damage is concerned actually a pretty meaningful bump to the to the flat damage of the ability keep in mind q's damage can multiply and go higher and higher if it bounces off and kills things it bounces off of so that 275 base damage can be even higher um this is an ability with a total attack damage ratio meaning that a lot of the damage is carried by the ratio in and of itself you can see the nine percent damage amp at the end of the game and the ratio is up to 17 percent higher this ability he maxes first very meaningful bump to Jin's q damage he's certainly a weak champion right now we can solo q not seen in pro pretty meaningful there uh so cool good for him those are quite really nice to see uh nocturne getting some mostly sustained buffs uh these are all sustained things certainly this can matter in a team fight when you hit champions with it you get your healing back up and you know, the amount of healing is actually pretty meaningfully increased. Q's going to hit more often, which is just good. It's sort of modernized. Um, really nice that uh, if Shadow of Darkness is active, when you cast R, uh, it'll stay. Uh, basically, if, if you W before you dash, uh, you can kind of extend the duration and whatnot, uh, meaning that you're going to sort of keep your shield on and you can W first. Not that you really need to put your W on first, but I guess you can. Whatever. Um, I mean, this is kind of kind of minor. Uh, and then R is uh, Darkness for two more seconds, which is pretty cool. So that's kind of nice. The uh, only thing it really did the math for was the healing, because that was the only reasonably hidden numbers at all. And the healing is up about 50% at all times. It, it, it waffles back and forth. At level 6, it's actually 2.5 or 2 and a quarter times as good, but it waffles around 1.5x the healing. The healing ratio, by the way, for Umber Blades is an AP ratio. That's the only scaling in the game that it has, um, outside of the obvious attack speed, which is, I mean, a little bit meaningfully affected. Uh, base 10 second cooldown, so... Uh, this can come up more often, of course, uh, a little bit. Cool. Nocturne's a weak champion. Getting some buff seems good. More healthy in the jungle. I'm not sure how harmful his jungle clear really is, but this will certainly have an effect for sure. 50% more healing is nice to have. Um, yeah, cool. I don't know if he's going to be actually viable or actually strong, but I like Nocturne as a champion, so it'll be cool to see him get a little better. All right, so buffs to Olaf. One second flat off the cooldown. 25% higher AD ratio. I'm going to cover that first. Here's the E changes. As we full screen that very slightly, uh, the cooldown is obviously 8 to 12 percent better. Uh, considering that the E cooldown gets refreshed when you land an auto attack, this is a very, very large buff to a sustained dueling, which is pretty meaningful. As far as the damage is concerned, the little AD ratio buff does mean a little bit here. Keep in mind this ability, you're almost definitely going to max second in all cases. So it's going to be maxed by level 13, and there's your 12% cooldown buff. Here's your 10% or sorry, 10 flat damage buff because of uh, what his uh, total attack damage is going to give you. Uh, and it goes up to, I guess, plus 14 by the end of the game. But the ratio is 25% higher, as I said before, which means AD builds are more heavily buffed, which is cool. I very much like AD Olaf. I think it's more interesting than Tank Olaf. And uh, as someone who actually likes playing AD Olaf, I think Olaf was actually my first Mastery 5 champion in League of Legends playing AD Olaf top and jungle. I am happy about this. I like the champion. Uh, okay, so changes to his R. And I've heard the internet say, oh, they have totally nerfed Tank Olaf. First of all, this is a straight buff to Tank Olaf, so no. And then even in this case, uh, the flat bonus damage going down, but it has a total AD ratio attached. Well, here's the R damage. Um, levels 1 through 10, it is a stronger ability. And then you only need 30 to 15 more built total attack damage uh, to make that a buff, which is like literally Trinity Force, basically. And then in the end game, it really only takes you like Titanic Hydra 
and or a black cleaver and like runes basically which means by the way if you're like if you're playing celerity olaf with ghost you just hit that attack damage anyway so uh kind of hilarious that people love to not do math and then whine in reddit threads um because this pretty much can't be a nerf to tank olaf and it is about to ad olaf so cool great uh of course we saw olaf get a little bit of play um in pro, it got two plays in the NALCS, one play in Korea, as Peanut brought up the champion, and, well, their team is better than an SKT, so it didn't matter what happened there. But, cool. I like Busta AD Olaf. All right, Rangar. Rangar, Rangar, Rangar. Rangar, Rangar. Um, he's actually doing okay for being a recent rework. Uh, so, look, he winds up to about 45, 46% win rate, which is pretty reasonable for a champion that's two weeks old, considering he started at, like, 41 or something after the rework came out. He's gaining a little bit. Um, obviously, we're not seeing him in Protoss yet, because people have to relearn the champion. Uh, and there's a bunch of changes with a bunch of different things. Okay, so Ferocity will stick on the champ for two more seconds. That's quite nice. Um, there's a bunch of stuff that I don't quite understand being not a Rengar player. Things about the lockout of when you can, uh, when you gain Ferocity, can you cast the spell again? Um, when you gain Ferocity, can you cast the spell again? Like when the spell gains Ferocity, so only the spell used to gain full Ferocity is locked out. So which means if I get five Ferocity by using my Q, I can then throw it in power to E right away. There's no lockout. And even then, when I use my Q and something to 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 gain it, uh, it's only a 0.1 second lockout. So I don't just get cut, but it's you know still pretty quick. Um, so that's kind of nice. Okay. I guess W is remaining 0.25, I'm guessing for that. Uh, all right, as far as the Q damage, it's going up in basically all cases. We'll cover that in a second with the math. Uh, if Rengar presses Q or W during Bolo Strike's cast time, he'll now buffer those spells, cast them when that's done. That's kind of cool. And Thrill the Hunt, the vision lingers in the target while leaping still, and then some random buff fixes that don't do anything really for power. Um, not, not really, anyway. So as far as the Q damage is concerned, here's the table. So here, and again, this was a total AD ratio, right? And it went from 1.1 flat to 1.2, uh, 1 to 1.2 based on scaling with a damage buff here. So uh, here's the old damage, here's the new damage. Uh, the base damage of the ability if you don't build any damage items is this. The ratio is technically nerfed in the beginning of the game, but the math says you need 35, 32, 30, and then 135 right here attack damage to make Q a nerf. That's, uh, and that's bonus attack damage beyond what we've already done the math for. So unless you've built a pickaxe and a longsword at level 3, this is a buff. Um, technically, the ratio, again, is worse, but yeah, whatever. And then, yeah, the base damage and the ratio are both about 9% higher. So Rengar does more damage. He stabs better. His abilities flow a little bit better. Cool. Little buffs to Rengar. They're, for how many notes there are, it's not like these are massive buffs. They're all little small quality of life things, and that's kind of nice. Next up is Rise. Rise is the number one champion in Pro in 8.4 because, duh, uh, champion got really good after Archangels got buffed in 8.3, or sorry, 8.4 itself. So changes to the abilities. Uh, Realm Warp, 50% longer cooldown. That's a mostly a nerf to Pro, which I am happy about. I am glad, 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 glad that Realm Warp is bearing some of the nerfs here. As far as the other changes, Rise is basically losing some of his wave clear power. Um, Pro tends to be really... What's interesting is... Wave clear tends to be a more pro-sensitive nerf than it is in solo queue, um, which you'd think is kind of weird because um, worse players don't last hit well, and so wave clear is really powerful for them. But really, it comes down to the fact that pros still use wave clear better, um, generally speaking. And obviously, there's exceptions to the rule. Champions like Heimerdinger are better in solo queue than they are in pro. Although to be fair, I think they are untested in pro. I think the champion can still be viable. But we're getting off topic. Um, yeah. So damage down. Uh, sorry, damage up slightly on Spell Flux until max rank, but the spread damage is down by half, which is pretty meaningful. Now, certainly, a lot of Rise's wave clear damage can be just, just from his Q, which of course it will be. Uh, but consider the fact that now E as an ability you simply max by itself. Uh, e, e an ability that you max by itself, its wave clear tools are down quite a bit to the tune of quite a bit of damage by 75, actually by max rank. Um, AP ratio also affected by, the, by a very similar amount. Uh, but also you have less reason to rank it up because it's no longer your best wave clear tool and because the damage scaling is is five less per rank anyway. Uh, I've seen every ability order under the sun for Rise. I've seen Qmax and Emax and a mix of all the things in between. Um, Qmax will be more likely now. Uh, e also is very mana hungry, which is interesting. And so um, even less reason to Emax and, and spam E in lane. Ultimately, this is a nerf to the champion. It's a nerf to his wave clear. Absolutely, of course it is. You're going to kill minions less often now. And hey, less realm warps in pro is a good thing as well. Consider that Ryze has just 20% CDR in his build straight up now. Um, 
that you know putting this 180 and subtracting 36 from it makes up for more than half of the nerf anyway and so um basically present day rise in 8.5 with his conventional build has a very similar run warp to 8.3 rise and then his wave clear is down which is a good nerf all right moving on shivana last patch got nerfed for her q into her base stat through of the base stat change she's slightly weak um she's at like 49 percent solo q from what i can tell um i guess shivana's allowed to go back above 50 i whatever um She'll be a viable solo queue champion and will continue to not see pro play because no one cares. Uh, okay, partial rework to Skarner's E buff. Now keep in mind, uh, first of all, Skarner is the number one jungler in pro play by a long shot. For a champion that got these buffs at 8.1, it took three packs from to be the number one champion. Pros are slow to adapt. Who called it? I called it. I said at the 8.1 rundown, it's probably going to be the best jungler in the game, and pros are going to realize slowly over time. And they did. Yes, other junglers got nerfed. I'm aware there's other things going on here, but. Ah, okay. Skarner got some nerfs. Keep in mind that in 8.1, he got buffs to his base mana, his E damage, and the E stun. The only one that got reverted partially was the E stun. Skarner is still going to be an exceptionally strong champion in pro play, an exceptionally strong champion in solo queue as well. Of course, uh, yeah, Skarner is super, super strong. Um, I want to point out that, uh, much like I talked about in 8.1, whenever you stun someone with a thing like Fracture... Um, not only does it refund the cooldown of the E based on the duration of the stun, but it also gives him attack speed and move speed and mana regen and all those other stuff as though he's under a spire. So um, stun duration is actually a very sensitive change because it means a lot on Discarner. Cool. We'll make him still very strong. He should still be seen in pro. He should still be about 50% in solo queue. Swain is a champion that I still think is quite strong overall. Uh, is still sitting just a bit below 50% win rate in solo queue, so I don't really understand. Uh, or sorry, I do understand the reason to buff him. He's probably not that hard of a champion to play, and so um, with a more shallow mastery curve, I think they're more willing to give him buffs right away. So Q cooldown buffs, W radius buffs, E radius buffs. Uh, and then R, the explosion damage. Um, now pass through champions, which means you're going to get large chunks out of everyone. Uh, so all of these are straight buffs to the abilities. Um, let's look at what that means. As far as Q cooldown, I don't think it means that much. It ends at the same point. And honestly, in the first eight levels, I don't think you have the mana pool as Swain to really do that much of the ability. Uh, that said, when they nerfed Zoe's Q cooldown by one second, it was a 1.8% uh, win rate cut. Uh, so maybe I'm underrating what early cooldowns really do mean for the Q. It can matter, absolutely. Of course it can, but I don't know, whatever. It doesn't seem to be that big of a deal in my opinion, but hey, you know what? You do you, Swain. Uh, I'm a little sad they didn't just like make it a one second per level cooldown gate, but you know, whatever. It doesn't really matter. Uh, the rest of these ratios are too, like they're not really worth mathing out in my opinion. He's going to hit his, his abilities more often and he's going to have to, he's going to cast his Q more often, which is cool. Um, I think this puts Swain in an actually strong spot for solo Q. Anytime I get filled mid or choose to play mid secondary, I will probably opt into playing Swain. Now, Swain still has bad matchups into Assassins because he can't really land his E very easily. Um, those counter picks still exist. I think he's now exceptionally strong into other mid range mages. And I think, and by the way, we saw a couple of, we saw one Swain pick and one Swain ban in LCK a couple days ago as a uh, counter pick to a top lane. It didn't do all that much, but it got played. Um, I think we see Swain in pro as of this patch. I think these are enough buffs that people will try to play Swain in pro. And he'll be a viable mid laner, mostly picked against mid-range mages. I think he probably shouldn't be blind picked, but he'll be very good when you're against things like Malzahar, in my opinion. Tristana's getting nerfed, and Tristana is an interesting champion. I'm going to say two things about AD carries right now. Um, one, I don't think Trist is in a bad spot overall. I think bot lane in general, outside of, I guess, Callista sort of specifically... Um, although I think she was still played some in 8.4, uh, in pro and such as the life of Callista. She's a very pro sensitive champion. Basically every bot laner is viable right now. Um, Lucian's gotten played in mid and top still, and he's, I think he's reasonable in bot lane. Callista's still getting played in pro, I'm pretty sure in 8.4. Trist, Sivir, Twitch, like all these champions, Cogma, etc. I really think the balance is very, very close along, uh, across all these champions. I think bot lane's in a very balanced state, one of the most balanced states it's ever been in, in, in solo queue at the very least, in a very long time. And even in pro play, I think it's in a pretty good spot outside of Varus being probably a little bit overtuned, um, but that's kind of it. Um, however, the internet fucking loves to rage about Tristana. Yes, I realize that she's a very generalist AD carry. She has decent early game, decent mid game, decent late game, very long range, very good safety. Like, 
what's her weakness and that's not really one except for i guess less team utility so i understand that like she appears very strong and yes she is on the slightly strong side in the general sense but i don't know i think tristana is more complaining about that she actually is powerful Either way, some nerfs. Uh, her range going down in the early game and then a little bit by the late game and Rocket Jump base damage going up by 25. So as far as the range is concerned, here's the table. Um, now, yes, 5 to 1% doesn't seem like a very, very large nerf, but I mean, realistically, this does have an impact. Uh, you don't pass Caitlyn levels of range until uh, two levels... Or you don't pass like Ash levels of range until two levels later, 9 versus 11. You don't pass Caitlyn range until uh, one level later, 16 versus 17. At the end of the day, how many games do you really end the game on Tristana at level 18? Not really very many, right? But every game starts at level 1. So the 25 range you're going to feel always, and you're going to feel like, you know, a 13, 12, 11, 10, whatever range nerf throughout the rest of the game. Um, I like the idea of Tristana not eclipsing the long range AD carries by the end of the game. Like, I wouldn't mind her having, like, gates where it's like 325, or like 525, then 550, then 575, then ends at 600, like, at level 16. Like, I wouldn't mind that myself, but, I mean, either way, it's whatever. Um, maybe that the chunky range difference would be really awkward, that's probably fair, but... Uh, I mean, either way, this does, this does matter as far as range nerfs are concerned. This does mean something, and so, hey... Tristana is going to be nerfed a little bit. I also wanted to point out, by the way, that um, with, let's talk about Callista a second ago, when the idea was like, hey, you know, pros are really range sensitive to win rate. Or like, you know, range means a lot in pro play. It's like, I didn't buy that then. And as we see with Callista, she lost a lot of win rate in solo queue and I believe is still reasonably pro viable. I didn't actually spend the time to look at win rates because I didn't think I was going to actually talk about her in this video. Uh, or sorry, her pick rates in pro play, but... Um, she's like a 45% win rate solo queue champion and like still seen in pro. So, oh well. Uh, half of the Twitch E nerf got reverted. Turns out that I was wrong, as were the designers wrong, that press attack was going to be a buff to him. Uh, the goal was still to make press the attack a better uh, top lane slash jungle rune than bot lane rune to try to get some more of the juggernauts or fighters to try the rune out. I think that was successful. Champions like Camille and Aurelia do pretty well press the attack now, so I think that was successful. Um... But they did overvalue how good it was going to be on Twitch, and so um, they half reverted the Contaminate Damage nerf, which is fine. Twitch is already a balanced champion in solo queue, and in my opinion, it's still a viable champion in pro play, because I think he is. Especially when you're playing some pretty much low-impact bot lanes, like Brahm and Tom Kench are not going to all in you frequently. You can get away with playing Twitch in those lanes, in my opinion. Either way, Twitch is going to be back to being quite strong in solo queue, and I'll be playing him myself. Um... Volo Bear getting a very small nerf. Uh, the knockback duration is going down, so you're, you're hard CC'd for less time. That's a good thing. Cool. Okay. Now it's time for my favorite set of changes in the patch. Changes to Zoe. As you guys all know, I am an Zoe apologist. I don't even play Zoe that much. I'm probably mastery 2 at most on Zoe. But I didn't think Zoe was really that broken. But I did think, as I talked about in the previous video... Uh, that Zoe should be more around her auto attacks, more sparkles, and her W. And that's what's happening here. Now, they are, of course, also buffing her other abilities to try to bring her in line as a champion overall. Um, but they are doing that. So attack range up by 25. She's now conventional, like, marksman slash normal mage attack range. Cool. I think it's a very good thing. I think she should be allowed to use her auto attacks. All right. Major changes to her Q. The base damage has changed. The, the bonus damage, she's still keeping per level scaling on the bonus damage because I think that's still a viable thing, but it's no longer tied to more sparkles. Um, the total AP ratio is changing, and now the AoE damage, instead of being affected by the base damage, um, is different. Okay, so 8.4 versus 8.5. What does the base damage of the ability look like for more sparkles? It is very similar. Um, by the end of the game, the old ability would do more. But by the mid game, it's basically the same damage numbers. You can see 57, 57, 60 to 58, 65 to 60. Okay, uh, you know, the numbers are very, very similar. But the AP ratio in total is higher to the tune of about one seventh. And so at the very end here, because the base damage is lower in some cases, I said, how much AP does it take to actually buff the ability? These are all numbers that uh, Zoe can clearly hit in a regular game. 67 AP at level three is not going to happen. But considering that basically level 1 through 9 is a straight buff, and then if you're level 10 with only 50 ability power, you're trolling. Q does a bit more damage. Now, 500 AP by level 17 or 18 is, okay, a bit less likely, based on her build, excuse me. And so basically she is buffed in the early game, and it tapers off a bit to the end game. 
Yes, an end game Zoe can get to 700 or so ability power, but that's kind of really max items, rushing a death cap, etc. So, okay, Q damage is, I mean, roughly the same-ish. Like, roughly the same-ish is, is pretty much fair, slightly higher in the early game, roughly the same-ish. The AoE damage has gone up by quite a bit. The, the explosion damage is now 80% of the total damage of the ability, which of course is massively higher than the old damage of the ability. So the base damage is up by 1% to 50%, and the um, AP ratio is 2.4x what it was before. Zoe got her wave clear back. And Zoe right now, by the way, is about a, I think she's like a 54%-ish, 55%-ish win rate champion. Uh, sorry, fi uh, not 50, uh, 43%. 43%. Uh, I misspoke. I apologize. Uh, that would be very different. Um, so about a 43% win rate. So she does like need like 6% win rate given back to her in, in buffs. And uh, her AoE going up substantially is definitely a bit of that. That's a very meaningful buff here. Okay. Um, what about the fact that we just nerfed all of Zoe's Q? Where is it from before? Well, we did. I made this table. Okay. And this is one of the far right is what we saw before. This is the old 8.4 changes. To 8.5 is what we saw like two seconds ago in the video. So let's look at what it really meant as far as when Zoe was broken. Because keep in mind, our changes to Zoe in, in 8.4 were Sledgehammer the Q and then buff more sparkles, basically, right? And so what if we just buffed Zoe overall when Zoe was frustrating and I think some people thought she was overpowered. I didn't think she was. Okay, well, if, if you forget 8.4 and said, well, in 8.3 she was frustrating and the number one champion in pro play. Here's 8.5. Her damage is unequivocally down. And it's down by a lot. It's down, okay, it's the same at level 1, but it's down by a full one-third at level 18. So those level 18 one-shots do one-third less damage than before. That case was clearly affected. And the AP ratio is down about 8%, so a little bit. So back when Zoe was frustrating and considered to be overpowered, to 8.4, the base damage is down by a lot, the ratio is down by a little, she is still suffering a nerf to her Q. Cool. Great. That's there. What about the AoE? The AoE is more heavily affected because back in 8.3, the AoE is full values. So instead of her damage being down as much as it was before, it's down by this much. It's down by 20% to 50% by the end of the game with a 26% hit to her AP ratio. Still, of course, a substantial nerf to the champion compared to 8.3. And as we all know, the compensation compared to 8.3 was more sparkles with more damage, her W is going to do more damage, her attack range is going up. This is a good direction to the changes, right? They softened the Q sledgehammer, they found numbers they, they like a little bit more, and these are definitely much nicer numbers. I mean, for sure those are nicer numbers, her wave clears back up, etc. Um, and now her W getting some more range to match her auto attack range, of course. Uh, five more damage in the ability and 0.15 more on the AP ratio. Here's that buff right there. I think you are definitely not going to max W second. I think you probably still max E second, but I think it's worth potentially considering uh, the movement speed on W is still a quite nice skilling. The damage on W is a nice skilling. The cooldown doesn't exist on W because you just pick up something and cast it. I mean, theoretically, there's a chance you can, you know, put points at W second. I don't really see it, but maybe. Because you the E lost part of its um, level up ratio because the, the partial refund on cooldown is gone. Um, I think it's worth considering, considering, considering W second. After all, I think her strength is going to be in those messy team fights. We pick up spells and cast them all the time instead of being IE into Q as a pick mage, right? The direction of the champion is functionally changed from EQ one shot to mid range team fight, use more sparkles, use spells, etc. And because you're going to be trying for different spells and because fishing for EQs is less important, less of your power is on EQ, there is a non-zero chance the correct Zoe build is W second. Um, there's even a non-zero chance, though I think it's really small, that even maxing Q first could be wrong. Just because you're getting more and more of the damage uh, carried by the passive. I think that's incredibly unlikely. It's just a thought, but I think that's probably not going to happen. Q first, W, or E second. It's probably still E, but maybe... All right, next up, a bug fix to Scion when they recoded his E in 8.4. Uh, the radius was too big. They they basically coded it wrong, and it hit targets when it shouldn't have. Um, this does not have the effect everyone thinks it's going to have. I think this is a, a nerf to Scion, and that's fair. It should be a nerf to Scion. Scion's overpowered. But Scion was already seeing pro play in 8.3. 
Before this happened, Cyan was seeing pro play at 8.3. So Cyan's already good. And I, I'm unless I'm wrong, and it could be, this could be completely stupid, um, I believe that the bug came in in 8.4. Um, maybe I'm totally wrong. Maybe. Either way, Cyan was already quite strong the entire rest of the year. Cyan's been a good champion for a very, very long time. And even though ostensibly all the bugs have been fixed and he's back to the old state, Cyan is going to still be the number one tank in pro play. And all it took was people to realize they wanted to play Cyan. Cyan's been this champion for forever. And people are going to say, oh, but he runs Comet and Mana Flow Band and Scorch and he pokes you out of lane. Do people play Cyan and a Maokai who literally can't leave lane? Like, go watch actual, like, Scion top matchups and tell me who he actually bullies. Like, who he actually bullies out of lane. It's basically no one. Like, it doesn't actually happen. Yes, the poke is good. Yes, he's very frustrating. Yes, he is powerful. Of course, of course. He has lane priority, sure. But, like, he did this forever. Ease damage to minions has been entirely unaffected by everything forever. Cyan has been this good. Inertia in pro play is a thing. Cyan is now in the meta. Congratulations, Cyan has played in pro. This changes nothing about that. He'll be played in mid, he'll be played in top. He's the same champion. All right. Banner of Command, uh, after they bug... After they bug fixed, there we go. Um, the damage things that were happening. Uh, they basically did a... I mean, I guess bug fix, like... Um, this is, this is basically a nerf at 8.5 to Banner of Command, 8-shotting turrets. Um, I am kicking myself for not looking up the actual numbers, but I'm pretty certain I know the numbers. Um, Banner of Command made, uh, cannons do double damage, and actually this is, this is the kind of thing that I would do, is actually do the math here. Um, I am pretty sure this is a one-third damage cut. Um, I will look it up after the fact and include a table in, um, the image description down below the video, so that you can look that up here, um. If you ever want to see the numbers, just just open the description, put it in Imager. I don't have it right now when I'm recording the video, but it'll be there. Um, my instinct is it's a one-third damage cut to Banner of Command of Baron Minions against Turrets. Um, and the specific change is Banner of Command's damage multiplier against Turrets no longer stacks with the identical multiplier Hand of Baron that grants the Siege Minions. So yeah, so the bonus AD is still granted. Banner of Command when unaffected by Baron is still unaffected, which by the way, I talked to at least one pro who was like, Wow, dude, I bought Banner of Command and killed his turret at 15 minutes. This shit is broken. And it's like, did you not read the patch notes? Pre-20, the item is not changed at all. So, it was always like that, and you're insane. Right, and again, as I talked about Scion before, like, Banner of Scion mid is unchanged from the entire last year, roughly. Comet is overrated. I believe that. Anyway, I'm getting off topic. Um, cool. So this is probably a one-third. Maybe it's a one-half cut, but I don't think so. Um, and I think this actually lands in a sweet spot. Um, I would like if Minion Demon Tier Legend did not just smash cannon minions uh, through Banner of Command all the time. And that you got to simply um, enjoy your free siege and you got to make people engage on you. I think it's okay, personally. Um as long as the amount of time it takes is within reason. And I think Banner of Command taking 50% longer to kill the turret is fair. I think that's a reasonable change. So I think that's a good thing. Um, th this lines up pretty well with how I would like this to happen. So that's really nice. Um, yeah, they still do more damage than they did in 8.3 to the bonus attack damage bug fix. Yep, of course. Okay, moving on. Center Hulk nerfed by 5%. And the bonus health modifier is nerfed by one quarter. Um... They're mentioning the fact that, like, Jax is playing as tank. I don't know if I really think Center Hulk Jax jungle is actually good. Uh, it never actually deals damage. It doesn't really seem that tanky, but whatever. This is not really that important. Um, but yeah, we're basically seeing Sejuani every game, and Jarvan is still building Center Hulk every game. Um, when I really think Warrior is totally viable. Um, I know it can be hard to build attack damage on a jungler, because in pro play, people don't want you to attack their lanes. I get that. Whatever. Center Hulk is still a force multiplier for jungle tanks who build a lot of HP. That's a good thing. And uh, yeah, I'm okay with tank jungles getting weaker because I like fighters existing in the game. And really, they don't exist right now in pro, so that's cool. Uh, this has, of course, some level of effect on, on solo queue. Less than in pro, though. And it's a, it's a Sejuani nerf, so great. And it's a Skarner nerf for tanks Garner. 
Um, Chad Scarner is unaffected, which is just fine. Hextech GLP, the designers were afraid of how good it would be in the 8.4 rework, building out of Lost Chapter. They overestimated their concerns, so they're basically putting the damage back to where it was before. Um, the AP ratio is unchanged, unchanged, and the slow is going even bigger than before. So it's even better slowing. The base damage is back up to the old value of the base damage. The AP ratio is still worse, so it's less of a burst item in the late game. But yeah, Hexic GLP was definitely, I think, a weak in 8.4. It's getting buffed. I think it's worth considering once again on Swain as a slow item. I think it's worth considering once again on all the champions that were building all the other stuff. From what I could tell, Archangels versus Luden's Echo were reasonably well balanced against one another. Um, and so GLP entering the mix is going to mean you're more likely to have three real options for starting items. And that's a really cool thing. So great. Fun starting items in the mid lane role. Cool stuff. Warmog's getting nerfed. Warmog's getting nerfed. Again, it's basically more nerfs to tank junglers and somewhat tank top laners. The health threshold increased by 250. I did some numbers on that. Um, what I did here is I said, okay, let's say you're playing Sejuani, and you built Cinder Hulk in 8.4, and you built Warmog's right after in 8.4. You did the same thing in 8.5 with the, of course, Cinder Hulk nerf, as well as the Warmog's nerf. Basically, uh, Warmog would come online three levels later, level 11 versus level 14. Now, of course, in the real world, Sejuani brought a Resolve primary or secondary, which meant that she got more health in there because of her uh, Resolve path bonus. I didn't include that math because I didn't really care to. It's up to you to make that choice yourself. Either way, um, as you can see, here's how much health you would have needed to turn it on. 126 bonus HP, uh, which, by the way, uh, I forget get if I included that based off Warmogs or not. Yeah, I think this is, this is HP before being multiplied because you need 35 to gain 40. This counts the Cinder Hulk multiplier. So if you bought 146 health by level 12 or 126 health by level 12, basically if you have Warmog, Cinder Hulk, and a Ruby Crystal, bam, you get it. That's what the math says. Either way, Warmog's turning on about three levels later because that's how health scaling works. Okay, great. Um, I am kind of glad, by the way, that Warmogs is not a ubiquitous item. I, I want it to not be a ubiquitous item because I think it should be a real choice to say I want to have full HP at all times. I think that should be a choice. I think it should have to be a choice for top laners um, and junglers, tank junglers, tank top laners, to say I'm going to sacrifice or something um, to get infinite health regen. Um, and even if it just comes online later and has to be your third item instead of your second item, that's still a good change. I'm happy about it. So I'm happy about this change. And again, it's a nerf to tank tops, nerf to tank jungles. In 8.4, tank tops are almost ubiquitous. I like fighters being fighters existing. Um, because they removed 5 attack damage, 5 AD, XD, uh, well, not really 5 AD, 5 damage to minions went away in the previous patch. Uh, they're slightly buffing turret damage to melee minions so that you can hit your break point more frequently. Um, cool. Minions have 4% uh, less max HP after getting shot by turrets twice. Okay, cool. Next up, buffs to Cloud Drake. Oh, baby. Well, changes to Cloud Drake. Uh, so instead of giving 25 out of combat movement speed, it gives you 6% out of combat movement speed, but it now gives you also 2% move speed in combat. Here's the table. So champion base stats outside of literally Janna start at 325 and go as, fi as high as 5, or sorry, 355. So this is the base move speed um, range right here. Most live in this range between 325 and 345. There's a couple that are fast like this, but this is where they mostly live. So if you're a base move speed champion, your out of combat Cloud Drake gives you 20-ish move speed compared to 25. So it's weaker, but it gives you six and a half to seven in combat move speed, which I think most people would argue is a better result. Sure, that's fine. It probably is. Um, I want to point out, by the way, that again, the highest move speed in the game base move speed at 355, and 410 is what you have at 355, plus Boots of Swiftness, which means the highest reasonable base move speed in the game, uh, not counting multipliers like Aurelian Soul, Passive, and Zeal, and whatever else, um, puts you at 410, which means Cloud Drake is still slightly weaker out of combat. In basically all cases, and keep in mind that old Cloud Drake also got multiplied by Zeal, multiplied by Celerity, multiplied by... Um, any other move speed percentage gains that you would have via runes and uh, items elsewhere. But of course, in combat, it gives you something it never did before, and the amount of in combat move speed it gives you is higher than the amount of out of combat move speed you lost. Um, now, I do want to say one more thing, is that out of combat movement speed is um, used more than in combat movement speed. You're running around your lanes, etc., etc. Um, it probably still is an overall buff, especially when you're any basically normal champion, 
with boots two, you're going to be sitting at about 380. So this is, this is basically every champion in the game where they're going to sit at in the mid to late game. They lose 2.2 out of combat move speed and gain 7.5 in combat move speed. This is a buff. Great. Prison Domination plus one stat. That's great. Press the attack. Um, the damage amp nerf being softened, which will reintroduce it to bot laners. I'm actually interested to see now how many press the attack uses are going to exist in bot lane. I mean, it still matters for top lane as well, right? Your Darius, you land your, your three autos and your Q does 4% more damage than before. I mean, that's nice, right? Um, but basically, here we are. Um, once again, looking at the is it buffed or nerfed tables, how much damage has to come in before it's actually a nerf. Um, Right, in 8.4, 125 damage at level 1. Now it's 250 at level 1. Uh, basically softens that there. Press the attack, I think, is now definitely stronger as a keystone than it was in 8.3. Cool. I like more options. Also, Fleet Footwork being nerfed by half the sustain. Fleet Footwork is going to be out quite a bit more. Oh, also, this is nice. They only show the healing on Fleet Fork when it actually heals you. That's good. Um, this also, by the way, nerfs overheal because uh, you are less likely to heal yourself and then overheal as a result. We're going to probably see more presence of mind, even for AD carries. You know, you're going to play Twitch or Lucian or Jin or whatever, and you're going to level up and then just hit all your buttons. Um, not that you were going to necessarily run that anyway. You might have just gone Comet on Jin, regardless. But even Twitch, you know, can spend 120 mana the second he levels up. But we're probably still going to run... Um, yeah, gotta run press the attack and then consider presence of mind over overheal. Maybe. We'll see. Um, cool. These are all good nerfs. Um, less sustain in bot lane means poke is going to be better, which is a, is a very good thing. So cool stuff. Aftershock's cooldown increased by 75%. I think that's also pretty good. As a synergy fiction auto, I'm sad because I liked running Aftershock. Um, and, you know, getting free stats off of fling, but whatever. Uh, what's nice is it further solidifies Aftershock as a teamfight tool for top laners because for champions like Jin and Camille, Aftershock was actually the highest win, or not Jin, sorry, um, for Renekton, why did I say Jin? Renekton and Camille are going to have, um, a lot of affinity for Aftershock, uh, that was actually their highest win rate rune last I checked. This pushes it more to say, no, it's a teamfight rune, not just a laning phase tank stat rune. Uh, I still think this is viable on those users, and that's a good thing. Mana Flow Band has a cooldown indicator, that's kind of nice. Aftershock could use the nerfs, whatever, it's fine. Uh, this is super exciting for me. It, I like playing five man normals with my friends, and now it's much more likely for me to join my friends and play some games with them. That's going to look pretty cool. I'm looking forward to this. This looks kind of nice. Um, loot chests getting more different, specifically Ultimate Mythic Skins auto unlock, that you don't have to spend orange distance on them. Um, also, chests will now only drop shards worth a lot. This does not affect the level up chests, as far as I can tell, but only the ones you unlock with a key. That's kind of cool. Um, now, every ward skin comes with bonus orange essence uh, and champion mastery six and seven is going to be cheaper cool that's nice minor bug fixes uh queuing up orders other than q during w is kind of nice uh bone plating only goes on cooldown without doing anything uh, okay that's nice so bone plating as well bug fix which is nice and then yeah for the most part these don't really 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 matter Oh, no longer uh, modifies true damage. That was, I guess, an accident. Unlucky. Didn't realize it did that. That's a bad um, implementation. Whatever. Um, apparently, this was an incorrect heal amount. I have no idea what the heal was, but it's a, either a buff or a nerf to Targon's Brace. Whatever. Okay. Uh, none of these are very big. There's some skins coming out, including Resistance to Lowey. That's pretty cool. Kaisa has some skins. Choga has some skins. Cool stuff. All right, that's it for the patch rundown. Thank you all very much for tuning in. I managed to keep it under 45 minutes. Uh, that is exciting for me. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, my view on this patch is, again, I think Zoe's going in the right direction. I guess I'll do the TLDR, and it'll be over 45 minutes. Haha, -ha, I lied to you all. Kaisa's really cool. Azir early game nerf seemed to be effective, and it's going to be probably pushing him down and down in the tier list. He'll still be viable in pro. Galio... Wave clear will push him down in pro priority. I think he'll still be fine mana cost wise. Jin, I'm not sure if he's going to be viable yet, but definitely going to. This is a big enough uh, buff on paper that pros will try him in scrims and we'll see what it looks like. Uh, Nocturne buffs, probably not going to be seen in pro, but still a cool buff. Olaf, huge. I think he's going to be um, huge in pro play, and I think he's going to be very, very good in solo queue. Uh, Rengar going to gain a little bit more, probably still a little bit weak. Rai's going to go down in pro play for sure. Um, Still going to be sub-50 in solo queue, obviously. Shivana not going to be seen in pro, but above 50 in solo queue. Skarner deserve nerfs. Still going to be very, very strong. Swain going to be above 50 for his first time since the rework. Tristana, meaningful nerfs here. 
Uh, this will help against complaining. This will put him a little bit her a little bit down in pro play. Uh, Twitch will be very strong. Volibear will remain very strong. Zoe, very smart. Changes will be more about team fighting. Sign bug fix means nothing. Banner of Command is going to give teams more time to defend. Cinder Hulk means down for tanks. GLP, a viable starting option. Warmog's down for tanks. Might disappear. Uh, last thing in a turret's better. Cloud Drake straight buffed. And that's it that everyone cares about. Oh yeah, and press attack is now good. That's it. Bye.